Uh, and thinking about kind of the broader policy debate uh, within uh, American um, uh, public life and, and the broader conversations, it's obvious that there's not agreement on what to do. But there seems to me almost a negative consensus about what we do have. Uh, it's, it's not far-fetched to say that the current trajectory we're on is not sustainable over the long term. In terms of cost, all of you know, I think, the, the trajectory we were on. It wasn't that long ago that uh, health care expenditures is about 15% of GDP. Uh, in 2009, it was 17.6%, and it's projected to go up to near 20% by 2020. Uh, in terms of our main uh, uh, government programs, Medicare is projected to grow by 84% uh, between 2009 and 2020 if the uh, Affordable Care Act is uh, sustained. If it isn't, it'll go up by 101%. Uh, similar trajectory in terms of Medicaid, which of course hits the states uh, particularly hard. On the private side, private premiums, according to a recent Commonwealth uh, study of 2003 to 2010, have gone up 50% for families and 63% for employees. So costs are, are clearly heading in a direction that uh, we can't afford. And, and obviously, those uh, costs are coming out of the wage side of employee compensation. You look at access, and we're not heading in the right direction there. 28% uh, of working adult, working age adults uh, have lacked health insurance in the last year. It's 52 million Americans. Uh, about half of, the, of those who lack health, health insurance have um, have done so, have lacked it for more than three years. When you look at the employer side, the employer-sponsored health insurance program, which is the bedrock of our occupational welfare state, is now covering only a bit more than about half of, uh, of Americans. So this is clearly a situation, as it plays out over time, that uh, is really not going to be sustainable. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have with us today really an extraordinary uh, program. Um, I want to begin by uh, inviting uh, Senator John Marty to share his uh, uh, perspective on this. As many of you know, Senator Marty has been, uh, has been in the uh, Minnesota Senate since uh, 1987 and uh, as a graduate of St. Olaf, uh, Senator Marty has been uh, the, uh, the most sustained advocate for his single payer system in Minnesota and is well known around the country for his uh, his uh, uh, clear arguments for that case. After Senator Marty, we're, we're really quite pleased to have with us uh, Doug Holtz Eakin, uh, who is now, as you'll see from your program, the American Action Forum. Many of us know uh, Mr. Holtz Eakin from his work as a director of the Congressional Budget Office, which uh, whatever questions you might have about the work of the CBO, just think about the situation we'd be in today without it. Um, so please uh, warmly welcome uh, Senator Marty, and then we'll move straight to uh, Mr. holtz -Eakin. Senator Marty. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and, um, and glad to be able to participate. And I think, Larry, you set it up for us pretty well when we, you pointed out. I'm going to close this laptop. Um, you set it up for us pretty well in that uh, I think the one thing we do have consensus on is how bad things are right now. Um, General Mills, a person who deals with employee health care, said several years ago, if you tried to design a health care system that didn't work, you couldn't have done a better job than we have. And I think that sort of summarizes it. We, Doug and I, just met five minutes ago, but um, I think if you tried to look at our system, nobody would say it works right. Beyond that, you come to very widely different perspectives. And when we're talking about social insurance and talking about how we cover risks and everything else, I'd like to start out by asking us to try and rethink for a few minutes the terminology we use in the discussion. And instead of seeing health insurance, health care is an issue that involves social insurance and health insurance, think of it as more of a question of a public good. Something more, something that we as individuals and we as a society all need, like public education, like police and fire, 
And in terms of that, I mean something that you don't have to qualify for, you're, you're allowed to have it when you need it. Your child turns five years old, they get to go to kindergarten. I'd like to suggest if we made it that way, it's not just something that we're, we're not just a nation of 320 or 330 million individuals. We're also a nation of 50 states and thousands of communities and millions of neighborhoods. And we all need each other and we all need each other to be healthy. It's not just your interest to be healthy yourself, it's in our interest to make sure people are healthy too. So in the end, I guess I'd say I'd reject the assumption that what we need is health insurance. I think what we need is health care for everyone in a system that keeps people healthy and when they're not healthy because nobody's guaranteed a life of perfect health all the time, that they get the care they need when they need it as efficiently as they can. Again, not something you have to qualify for. If you do that, I like the analogy of police and fire, if you go home tonight and find your homes being burglarized and you call 911, I will guarantee you in no part of Minnesota and I don't think in any part of Pennsylvania or any other state are you going to find a police department dispatcher that gets on the phone and says, do you have police insurance? Does your policy cover home burglary? Do you have the copayment? They cover you, they take care of your needs, it works efficiently, it works well. The closer we get to moving from a health insurance system to a health care system, the healthier people and society is, the healthier our economy is, and the less expensive it is. When we talk about insurance, this is fundamentally, our system is fundamentally an insurance-based one, not exclusively. If you have insurance, whether public or private, medical assistance or blue cross or whatever, employer or individual based, that determines a lot of where you go for care, what kind of care you get and so on. But not always. We have one area at least, a couple areas, where we have health care that trumps the health insurance system. Where? Emergency room, hospitals, the most expensive places possible. And I think we as a society want it that way. We don't want a 12-year-old kid who's in an auto accident bleeding on the side of the road, well, your parents got insurance. It's not die, kid, don't. No, we have people come in, everybody. Emergency rooms are have to treat you. Hospitals take you. And so we do provide health care that trumps health insurance, and the more we move to a system that along the way, the dental care and every other kind of care gets it to the person when they need it, the healthier we are and the less expensive it is. So if this is the case, where we should treat health care as a, a need, a public need, a public good, not just for 330 indivi million individuals, but for us as a community, us as a state, us as a nation, then how do we do it? I think what we should be doing, what's been lacking in all these years of, of health care reform, the last I've been in the legislature, as Larry mentioned, for 25 years, we in Minnesota have been doing a lot of health care reform. Washington, the last few years, a lot of health care reform. Every state's doing it. Why? Because it's so expensive, we've got to find a way to make it cheaper. And every step of the way, we try and find new ways that become, well, new, some new procedure to measure, evaluate, calculate, make sure people aren't getting a drop of health care that they don't need or isn't super effective or isn't whatever, without ever thinking about the fact that maybe we should be working to make sure people get health care as well. So what we do is we talk about in Washington, like in Minnesota, how we're going to insure a few more people because people without health insurance is not a good thing. We all agree to that. So we want to cover more people. <clears throat> and so all those health care reforms the last 40 years, I would say, are based on the premise that health care is so expensive we've got to buy less of it and how can we make sure we do that in a rational way. And it's been a colossal failure. We're spending twice as much as other countries in the world are providing for health care. We're like 31st out of 34th in the industrialized nations in life expectancy. Not much better than that in infant mortality. And we're spending twice what the other countries are spending. So design a health care system that keeps people healthy and does it. So what we did, we put together several years ago a principles for health care reform. I can give you a link to them later if you want, but we figure... I think 
if you want a healthcare system that works, you have to meet these principles. I don't care how you do it. I got my own plan. I don't care if you come up with another way. What should it do? In order to keep people healthy and provide high quality health care, first principle, ensure that all Minnesotans, in our case, receive high quality health care regardless of their income. Second one is you're going to save money not by delaying, denying, restricting care, reducing the quality of it, but you're going to do it by making sure people get the care they need. We're going to save costs through prevention, efficiency, reduction of insurance bureaucracy, through smart care. We're going to cover all necessary care, not just the basic benefits package. I don't like this Cadillac idea. I think my teeth are just as important as my fingers and my toes. But dental insurance is a bonus. Our plan would cover dental care, prescription drugs, mental health, chemical dependency treatment. Would allow patients another principle, allow patients to choose their own provider. Be funded through premiums and other payments based on ability to pay so everybody can afford it. Focus on preventive care to keep people healthy. Ensure an adequate number of health care providers. We got a crisis in general practitioners, a crisis in rural communities. People can't get the health care not just because they can't afford it, because there's nobody to provide the care on a timely basis. And then we had two other principles, which you have to have in a good system. Continue the quality leadership in medical education, training, research, technology. Minnesota is a leader in the world in all those things and provide adequate and timely payments to providers. Sometimes government things like medical assistance don't pay on a timely basis. I think you need all those nine principles. So when we designed our Minnesota health plan, we put them in as legal requirements for the health plan to meet. It's interesting, when you provide health care to everyone, the only reason most people, some legislators, my party, the other party, well, it's a nice idea to cover everybody for all their medical needs, but we can't afford what we got now. How in the world are you going to afford that? Well, you know, if you do for things right, we can look at other countries, compare how they do it, and you can look at what we're doing wrong here. Minnesota every year has about 22,000 emergency room visits for dental care. You find me in an emergency room with a dental chair in it, I haven't seen one. Why do people go there? Because they don't have dental insurance. They don't have dental care. Their tooth gets infected, they go in, <laughs> run up probably five, six, seven hundred dollar bill that we're all going to pay for. Emergency room can't treat them. All they can do is give them Novocaine or some other pain relief, antibiotic if it's infected, and tell them to go see their dentist in the morning. 22,000 times a year in our relatively small state. You save money by delivering care efficiently, saving money by making sure people get care on a timely basis. And things that are extras, like chemical dependency treatment. You know, we seem to think that that's moral failure. Same thing with mental health. We used to consider mental health a moral failure. And if people would only take care of themselves, with those kind of illnesses, you know, it's not always something people can take care of themselves on. Is it worth my, is it in my interest to make sure I get chemical dependency treatment or my family members do if they need it? Yes. You all understand the reasons for that. It's also in my interest to make sure everybody else gets the treatment they do. If they got chemical dependency treatment when they needed it, you know what that would do to our prison population over a decade? Three quarters or more of the people who commit crimes, violent crimes, are under the influence of drugs or alcohol, or at least in some way it affected their behavior changing the crime. If we address mental health and chemical dependency treatment, it helps people be able to work. That boosts the economy every step of the way. So my point, and I'll close with this, to say that what I think we have to do in this discussion is not think of it just as something that we're trying to provide insurance coverage, social insurance for 5.3 million Minnesotans or nationally 300 some million people. But what we're trying to do is keep our community healthy, <laughs> keep all the people in our community as healthy as they can be so they don't need to go to the doctor that often. And when they do need to go, they get the care in the appropriate way up front as quickly as you can. So again, the, to close, I'd say that as we get into the discussion, which I'm looking forward to, I think the whole premise of seeing it as an insurance system instead of a public need that benefits every one of us, I think that's what we have to change. And I'll give reasons for why. <laughs> and I don't have to tell you about all the fatalities and everything else, but um, it makes sense to do it the right way, and that's the direction I'd love to see us head. 
thank you very much, and I'll be ready for the discussion after Doug speaks. Thank you, uh, Senator Marty. Mr. Doug holtz -Egan. Well, thank you for the chance to be here, and congratulations on this wonderful new institute. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to join the Senator and, and Larry in this conversation. Uh, I thought I'd just open with a couple remarks about the state of play with our social safety net and uh, avenues where we might uh, pursue to improve it. And certainly, uh, the, the social safety net in the United States is in, uh, in terrible shape. Uh, if you look even at some of the less highlighted uh, aspects of it, our unemployment insurance and training program, uh, it has proven uh, to be a concern for years and in this recession, uh, an absolute disaster. We we fail to prepare workers for spells of unemployment. We then tell them to stay unemployed uh, longer because we'll pay them more, and then they fail to get the training they need to actually find their next job. It's, it's an expensive and highly uh, inefficient system that doesn't serve the, the American worker well. Uh, the, our Social Security system is on track to have a 23% across the board cut uh, in, in about two decades. It's uh, a terrible disservice to the future retirees to have a system whose plan it is to have uh, a, a hatchet cut across uh, everybody um, in the midst of retirement, that, that's, that's no plan. It's a poor uh, plan for a country of the, the, the greatness of the United States and it should be fixed immediately. Um, our, our Medicaid program is one that serves its beneficiaries incredibly poorly. Uh, they are four times more likely than the uninsured to end up in ERs for ordinary care, very expensive settings. Uh, we find increasing difficulty for um, Medicaid beneficiaries to f get uh, uh, access to physicians at all, specialists for sure, even primary care physicians. And we have horrific episodes where uh, beneficiaries die because of the failure to have uh, their, their real uh, pressing needs met. Medicare, because of its increasing reliance on provider cuts and, and reduced reimbursement rates, is headed down the Medicaid track. Uh, and uh, under the current projections, the CMS actuary, Richard Foster, says that Many hospitals will go out of business and we're gonna have increased difficulty, particularly in rural areas, uh, finding access to care. So we have a, a, a system of, of programs uh, that simply aren't serving beneficiaries well. Uh, they're certainly dangerous to our budget. Uh, if you look at Social Security right now, it's running about a $50 billion annual cash flow deficit. It will rise as, as the years uh, pass. Uh, Medicare, the gap between premiums paid in payroll with assets collected, and outlays by the Medicare system is $280 billion right now. We have 10,000 new seniors every day. We have rising health care costs. Medicare has been historically responsible for a quarter of our outstanding national debt. It'll be a third in 10 years. It is the fiscal cancer that, that threatens this nation. And Medicaid is essentially all deficit financed at the moment. So uh, these are programs that don't serve their beneficiaries well. They're, they're hurting the budget. And we've created new ones. Um, I, I consider the Affordable Care Act to be one of the most ironically named uh, pieces of legislation ever. It is, in my estimation, uh, an additional burden that we will simply be unable to, to sustain in the years to come. So uh, these, are, these are threats to, to the, the credit rate in the United States, to its ability to access international capital markets. Uh, they are the heart of why we are headed toward what Erskine Bowles has called the most predictable crisis in history. And we need to change that trajectory. And for that reason, they're dangerous to our economy. Uh, we, are, we are in the, the process of delivering to the next generation a broken social safety net for the future poor and aged, as well as a broken economy and an enormous amount of debt. Uh, it's not something that anyone should be terribly proud of. And so the notion that somehow we're fine, that we should keep Medicare as you know it, that we should just uh, continue the social security system unchanged, I, I think is a tremendously misleading argument that gets made. We need to change direction dramatically and, and fix uh, this and put our house in order. And, and to me, that starts with uh, the health programs. And so let me just say a couple words about uh, the future of these health programs, then we can have a discussion. I mean, certainly I think uh, we, sh we should start over with the Affordable Care Act. I, I know the politics of this, and uh, you can make a lot of money trying to figure out the, the, the outcome tree for what the, the future of the Affordable Care Act is. You know, repeal the individual mandate, pour trillions of dollars into a broken insurance reforms, or preserve the individual mandate, run out of money and just have the insurance forms and no subsidies. Uh, there are all sorts of possibilities. But the biggest mistake that was made in the Affordable Care Act was to heavily intertwine into it Medicare cuts 
and Medicaid expansions and thereby interfere with the ability to reform those programs which are already broken and expensive and had as, it has put off the ability to, to reform these in, in a deep meaningful way. Medicare would be a great thing to reform because it drives a lot of bad medicine in the United States. Uh, Medicare is a, a, is a microcosm of what's wrong with the American healthcare system. It's got Part A's which pays some hospitals and Part B pays some doctors, Part C pays certain insurance companies, Part D pays the drug bill. There's absolutely no beneficiary to be found in there anywhere. It's a fragmented set of payment silos, uncoordinated, and in some, in some cases working at odds with one another. We pay hospitals fixed amounts called DRGs. Their incentives are to do as little as possible, sometimes too little. We pay doctors on a fee-for-service basis. Their, their incentive is to have volume. Doctors practice in hospitals. I don't know if you've ever been in a hospital. Doctors hate the administration. Administration hate doctors. It is utterly incoherent and is driven by the Medicare system. And we'd get better medicine if we fixed Medicare. And at, the, and at the heart of the Medicare system, the fundamental contradiction that we have never uh, uh, chosen to address is the fact that we say to the beneficiaries, you may have all the finest medical science that America can produce at low or no cost. Part D is 75% subsidized out of general revenue, so is part, part B. A is running cash flow deficit. So this is all subsidized by general revenue. And that turns out to be really expensive. And then we say, oh my God, stop that. We go to the providers and they quit. Either we're not going to cover this, literally, or we cut their reimbursements to the point where they do actually stop. But that violates the promise to the beneficiaries. They say, wait a minute, you promised me all I could have. Low or no cost, what's up? So we put the money back in. And until we actually make a reform that puts a budget constraint on these programs, they, that contradiction will persist. We need to say to the providers and the beneficiaries, this is the money that you have for this year find some efficiencies, deliver a quality uh, product, and take care of this beneficiary for, for that amount of money. It's, it, until we do that, we will, we will never uh, solve this problem. And so to my eye, it seems that, that in Medicare especially, we have to recognize that need for a budget and recognize that in the end, the, the ultimate ethical resting place for decisions about health care is going to be the American family. Americans are not going to have insurance companies making these decisions. They are not going to tolerate a government bureaucrat making these decisions. They are the only ones ethically well situated to make the tough decisions about some alternatives in, in care. And so if you're going to do a reform, you better put the money where the decisions are being made so that they're done in a sensible fashion. And that is one of the reasons I think that things like a premium support plan where a fixed amount, you know, means tested, risk adjusted, per beneficiary, identifies a budget constraint and the money is controlled at the place where there's an ethical foundation for the decisions that are made. That's, that's the end game where I, I don't see any other, other way for us to do it. And we might get there by running a horse race, try a premium support program, and put a budget on the fee-for-service side so it's a level playing field and, and, and see which one seniors pick. But, but going forward, we will have to do something different. It will have to involve a serious budget constraint on these programs and it will have to involve coordinating around a beneficiary so that we get higher quality care in, in the process of delivering medicine to American seniors. And because the, the, the government's such a large payer already, that will drive delivery system uh, reforms all through uh, American medicine. And so I think that is the key. It's something we have to do at this moment. And um, the sooner we can get past the, the, the current debate over the future of the Affordable Care Act and get on with that agenda, uh, the better off we'll be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that was great. And so we're going to have a conversation here, talk for a little bit, and all of you are going to get involved in the conversation. So uh, some question you're dying to ask and get into uh, the, the flow here, uh, frame it up because we'll, we'll be at you in a second. Um, Mr. holtz -Eakin, let me just pick up on what I take to be uh, Senator Marty's main point. Can, do you think the country can afford to cover, uh, cover health care for all Americans? So I think there has always been uh, a shared objective that we should have quality health care, the, the production, consumption, use of health, of health uh, therapies and, and that. And then there's the, the access to insurance, mm -hmm. uh, the financial product that um, uh, shifts around the, the nation's health care bill. And, and the object of reform has really sort of been to get both those to, A, work together, 
in ways that don't right now, and, and to, to get the health care bill down. I mean, our biggest problem is that we spend too much as a nation and get lo low quality results. So I think the key is, what's your strategy for doing it? This strategy we've adopted, a coverage first, write checks to everybody, and then hope the costs go down, is, is, is not going to work. I mean, we know a couple of things. Number one, if people have insurance, they use more stuff. So deep insight. Um, so the bill's going to go up, not down, with the expansion of the coverage. Uh, and um, if you say to the providers of America, here, here's, uh, we're, we're going to cover all these additional people, and they come flooding in, and we don't have enough hospitals and docs and other providers, uh, and then you turn around to them and say, you know, it's time for you to change the way you do your business so that we can save some money. They're going to say, drop dead. We're busy trying to take care of all these people you just gave us. So I've always thought as a matter of the political economy, the strategy we're seeing in the U.S. is exactly backwards. We should do the delivery system reforms first, and to the extent practical, take the cost savings and plow that into coverage expansions. It's a different strategy. Okay, but just to be clear, you believe, at least in principle, that everybody should get a health care system, health care, and the current way in which we do it, which is basically, you know, emergency rooms is the backup, is not the way to do it. The question is sequencing of what to do first. It's a sequencing of the insurance and, and the delivery system reforms, and, and I guess the only, you know, uh, the thing I'd caution you to say is to be careful when you say you know, everyone should get health care. There isn't a one size, one thing called health care. And, you know, some people, when people talk about getting health care, they talk about, you know, treating people for a uh, catastrophic injury. You know, there's a whole range of things which qualify as health care. And, and the question is, um, you know, which ones are we going to have which are uh, driven by uh, centralized decisions, which aren't going to let people pay? Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Marty, um, Appreciate your your uh, earnestness and and the uh, the durability of your efforts in this area. But for people who look out at what government does and have some skepticism, and I don't mean just you know kind of the thing we read about in the paper all the time, but even things like you know Medicare and Social Security uh, and Medicaid, as as Mr. Uh, Holtz Egan was just going through, why should we trust the government to? Uh, you know, expand its role and, and even move beyond financing into the delivery of health care. Why, why does that, why should we have confidence in that? Sure, a, a couple of points. One of which is some areas where government does deliver health care, it's done very well. When I was a kid, school nurses, that's great health care. It's convenient, everybody gets access to it. Kids whose parents are insured or not insured, they still had the school nurse. VA, some of the best health care in the world. That's for everybody who qualifies because they're veterans. And so the whole point is I don't want a government run health care system. I don't want an insurance run health care system. I want a doctor and patient run health care system. And that's basically what we want to do is take away this where you spend all your time trying to fight for the care you need. The people who are the most most in need of care, sometimes most in need of urgent care, maybe not emergency room, but because they've got cancer, they've got a serious illness or disability, they're the ones least able to fight for the care, fight to make sure they can qualify for the care. And again, it's in my interest and your interest to make sure that that person over there gets the care they need because every step of the way, I mean, the, you only have to look at the fact that the countries who do provide health care for everyone do it cheaper than we do. And I can give you a thousand reasons for that. But I, I don't disagree with Doug that the I mean, I fully agree with them that the system is very messed up and that everything we're trying to do is say, it's not, okay, first you're going to make sure you do this to reform this part of the system. You're not going to change the payment systems and everything else if you've got one small niche of the market you're trying to do it with. If you're doing it based on, if you tell Blue Cross, the largest um, insurer in Minnesota, if they're going to try and make a change, it would be in a Minnesota health plan in a universal system interest to have a nurse in every school. That's where you see kids every day. That's where you can get them care for convenient routine things. You can check up on them, make sure they get their vaccinations, make sure everything else. That's the cheap way to do it. But Blue Cross is never going to do that because even in their highest communities, they're not going to have more than a third of the kids in the school who are covered by Blue Cross. So they're not going to put a nurse there. You have to have a logical system. And frankly, the only way you're going to, I mean, the, the question is, I mean, I think everybody is going to say, well, we don't want people to die from a lack of health care. It happens in our country very often. But we don't want people to die from it. So we will make sure that we have the safety net of the emergency room. But people who 
really don't need it. People who are mentally ill, who are Vietnam vets who are homeless, you know, they, they go to the emergency room because they know the hours. It's always open. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Marty. Uh, let's pick up on the, uh, the issue of costs because I think mm -hmm. that for all of us, that, that is one of the bottom lines, obviously in addition to, uh, to health. Um, and uh, Mr. Holtzigan, you, you make an important point that we've got to set some kind of caps. We've got to have a budget around what we're spending on health care. I don't think there's any disagreement on that. What I hear is a disagreement about at what level. And so one way to think about this is the trajectory that Ronald Reagan started us on when he uh, created the DRG system for hospital payment within Medicare. And it was expanded, of course, to RBRVSs and then the outpatient and so forth. Uh, and, and so some people look at that and say, okay, this is a foundation for rate regulation. And it would create a budget. Now, you might not like how the budget is created, and there's concerns about that, uh, but it would not be on the individual level where there might be more vulnerability and variability in terms of the capacity of individuals who might not have uh, adequate uh, uh, resources to uh, afford insurance. Why not go the route of a system level budget rather than an individual uh, oriented budget of a premium support system that you're talking about and others? So let me be clear. I was talking about federal programs having a budget and having to uh, operate within them. I, I have no desire to place a uh, you know, nationwide cap on U.S. health care spending. Um, you know, if, if it were the case that individuals were, as they do in, in, in other areas, evaluating the benefits, facing the full cost, and deciding to spend 28% of GDP, then fine. I mean, you know, if that's what, if there's a high value product that people want to consume, there's no reason why we should cap it at some arbitrary level. So I'm not a fan of that. I am, you know, I think, you know, it's, there's a pretty clear case that we have a low value uh, system where we don't uh, have people aware of the cost. They, they can't make calculations about the benefits of alternative uh, approaches, prevention versus remediation, alternative therapies, and so there's all sorts of, you know, infrastructure you want to fix on that front, but th that doesn't mean you have to have a cap for the U.S. as a whole. I think it would be a mistake. Uh, Senator Marty, uh, there's some folks who, who kind of look out at a system where there would be a wide open door to health care and worry about overconsumption, that people would just, you know, take this as an opportunity to go in and, and get health care they don't need to press for, for diagnostics and um, therapeutic uh, services that would just absolutely blow the, 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 the roof off of health care costs that are already on a unsustainable future path. What's the problem with that argument? I mean, shouldn't we be worried about the disincentives that we, might be created? We should be very worried about the disincentives, but we're spending all of our efforts trying to make sure that people don't overconsume consume health care. And we're spending twice what everybody else spends because our whole focus is on making sure nobody overuses it which means they don't use it when they ought to use it. Instead, they use it when they finally get it, which is it the most expensive and the least useful way possible. Who should be the gatekeeper to make sure people don't get too much health care? I don't think it should be insurance companies, and I don't think it should be government. Who do I think it should be? Doctors and patients. And you think, oh, they all want the Cadillac treatment. I had back surgery 20 years ago. Um, first doctor I went to, back surgeon, said, you need surgery, and you need it right away. Got a second opinion, also a back surgeon. No, there are lots of other things we should be trying first, and I went with him, and we ended up getting surgery anyway. But the point is, people don't want to have back surgery for the fun of it. They want the least intrusive option. If you ask people about advanced directives for seniors, that's where we spend so much dollar, the last few weeks of life. If you have put a nurse or a doctor, some medical provider to sit down, counsel the patient, and talk with them, what do you want? Very few people are gonna say, oh yeah, resuscitate me when I'm terminally ill in a lot of pain. Very few people want that, but our system is designed to do that because we don't spend the time talking with people. You actually find out if doctors and patients are doing the care provision, people tend to go with the smartest, the least expensive thing. Not always, sometimes the smartest thing is the most expensive. But there are far too many times when we don't do it that way. And this idea that people want as much health care as they can get. We love our doctors. We just don't love to go visit them. And 
to use the example, hey, next Thursday morning I got some time off and maybe I could go get myself another colonoscopy. <laughs> we don't do that. We don't want to go see the doctor. We go when we need to and we often have to be pushed to doing it and we set up a system that means people who need to be pushed to doing it have roadblocks in the way so we get it most expensive. Okay, so we're landing up these different themes which you all are gonna engage in. I'm gonna ask one more question, and then you all are gonna start asking the questions. So the last question I'm gonna ask, uh, at least right now, uh, is about the Affordable Care Act. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking back about two decades ago, I was in DC on a panel, and there was someone from Heritage, uh, and it was a panel which there was a, someone for National Health Insurance, which basically said general revenues uh, should be used to create a universal health insurance system. The person from Heritage said, no, there's a, there's a free market approach in an in a, in a area where there are all these market uh, uh, hurdles to creating genuine market dynamics, and that's the individual mandate. Uh, and you know, you go back to Richard Nixon and, and, and others, uh, the Dole Plan back in 93, 94, had an individual mandate in it. Somehow we've moved from, from you know, this kind of, what I thought was the pairing of national health insurance tax supported and individual mandate as a basis for more of a market oriented approach into a system in which I'm having a hard time figuring out, uh, you know, where's the compass in this? So <laughs> could, could you help me? <laughs> we're lost. Yeah, we're, we're, I, I feel like I'm lost. Mr. Holtekin, could you help me understand wh what part of this story have I got wrong? Where, 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 where has the debate gone between the left and the right, and, and frankly, particularly among conservatives and Republicans, that's deviated from what has been clearly a trajectory in the past. Richard Nixon, uh, Dole, and, and uh, the Heritage Foundation all lining up with an individual mandate, and now we seem to be in a point where I'm, not, I'm, I'm seeing something different, where Republicans are saying, nope, individual mandate, this is not the direction we want to go in. Uh, very hard question. Let me try to evade you. Um, <laughs> uh, so I knew I was lost. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so the first thing to recognize is that we are no longer in the world of uh, Richard Nixon or, or, or Bob Dole. I mean, we have we have run the clock forward in significant ways, and, and among them are the fact that the one of the economic foundations of the the, the, the individual mandate is the notion that there are these cost shifts going on in the healthcare system. That in fact, if you if you don't uh, put the mandate in there, there's going to be these uh, uncompensated uh, costs that have to be somehow shifted around. What's happened since that argument first got made is that th those costs are now total uncompensated care is 40 odd billion. If you really look at who the mandate forces to buy insurance, now that since since the Affordable Care Act has guaranteed issue and uh, the rating bans, the, the only people you're forcing to buy insurance are uh, a handful of young people who contributed about eight billion of those uncompensated costs, and so. The, the, the economic foundation of having to do this is this $8 billion in this enormous multi-trillion dollar system when in fact the super cost shifting is actually entitlement programs. So if you want to fix cost shifting, it's the cost shifting from Medicare and Medicaid into private payers that you ought to fix and the government could fix that on its own without going out and, and interfering in the private sector. So the sort of fiscal uh, uh, arrangement around the argument on individual mandate is the first thing. Right. The second is um, the, the, the the companion piece of, of architecture is the exchanges, as they're called in the Affordable Care Act, and exchanges can do uh, a couple of things. They can be um, consumer marketplaces, and Lord knows I think we need those. They're terrible insurance uh, markets in many ways. They can be places uh, that are depository stores of value, so multiple people can contribute to an individual's uh, capacity to buy an insurance policy, and they can be regulators, both financial and social, and uh, the fact that the, the, the mandate might drive people into these exchanges that many conservatives view as uh, active, uh, uh, engaged in uh, social regulation is, has really hurt them as well. And then there's just the fundamental constitutionality, which until you pass law, people don't really, I mean, they don't think about it hard. And, and I think uh, there, there's a, a very good question as to whether the Supreme Court's going to be able to, to, to uphold the Affordable Care Act as a, as a matter of both the, com especially the Commerce Clause. Well, we definitely agree about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so Senator Marty, let me uh, come back to you on the individual mandate, because again, I'm coming to this, thinking back to this panel, and I'm also thinking of you know the last three or four years. There were a good number of single-payer people 
who were furious at the public option. They saw it as a kind of a weasley way to, to duck out of the, uh, the single payer approach, which was more efficient, more equitable, and so forth. And then you end up with an individual mandate, which some see as you know throwback to Richard Nixon. Do you see the individual mandate as a kind of halfway house, or is it really just the wrong direction? Uh, kind of, uh, you know, kind of politics uh, taking us down, uh, you know, a path that, that again is going to have all these problems. The individual mandate, Doug may be right, uh, Mr. Holtzikin may be right that it's only eight billion those young folks who are not buying insurance who could afford it but aren't buying it because they want to do it. But under that sort of healthcare system, you have to have it. The insurance companies say, look, if we can't turn you down for coverage, then you got to be covered so you don't wait till you're sick to come in. So um, yeah, you have to have it that way. I'm not one who thinks that that's the direction we ought to go. Why did the Republicans who, not all of them ever supported that, but those who did support it, why are they opposed to it now? I'd say some of it's politics. I mean, Obama proposed it, we oppose it. And the person, I mean, Tim Pawlenty and I don't agree with much of anything, but you gotta say he had to hit the nail on the head when he called it Obamacare. I mean, it was a clever line. He made it before he was supporting <coughs> Romney, <laughs> when he was running against Romney, and, and it was, but it, it hit the nail on the head. It was sort of designed, you gotta say, it was designed after what Massachusetts did under Romney. And in it, I don't think it's a fundamental, I describe the Affordable Care Act as bold tinkering. Bold because 32 million Americans who had no health insurance will now have some health insurance. That's bold. Tinkering because it's basically a piling on of what we already have. A little bit more for a few more people doing this and that and fundamentally didn't reshape anything. And I have concern, I mean, I think earlier a conversation is Affordable Care Act more expensive than the current system will be if we didn't make the changes. I don't know, I'm not the economist. I never worked for a Congressional Budget Office. I think what I'm hearing is they say it'll be less expensive, but in both cases, the current system and that is gonna be far more than we're paying now. And some of the savings, of course, as he pointed out, are in Medicare cuts and so on. So uh, bottom line is I think it's not fixing the problems of lack of health care. It's not fixing the cost drivers. It's not fixing that. It does help in that a lot of people who had nothing will get something, and that's key. Um, so we agree on some of the problems with it, but um, I just don't think that insurance mandate, I don't, I, again, I reject the notion that insurance is what we should be talking about. I think we should be talking about health care. Great, okay, now it's uh, on your shoulders. I think we have a, and if you could just identify yourself, it's very hard to see here in the lights. My hope would be, and what I see is, I don't, I don't call my, my plan would be considered a single payer plan, but what I'm seeing is a healthcare system where the single payer portion is that the entity, the health plan is paying all the bills, one payer. And, but in terms of the, in terms of the dynamics there, yeah, you set a budget for a hospital. And you take a hospital in our country, a thousand bed hospital here and a thousand bed hospital in Canada, One's gonna have hundreds of billing clerks. One's gonna have a handful of them. Both CEOs of the hospitals in both countries, they're told at the beginning of the year, here's the budget. It's gonna be X number of hundreds of millions of dollars for our size hospital. This is what we're gonna operate on. The Canadian one knows now we deliver the healthcare. The US one says, okay, now we deliver the healthcare, but now here, where are we gonna get the money from? They know what the bottom line is gonna be. They just don't know who's paying it and how many times they have to send out repeat bills how many different providers, how many co-pays they have to try and collect. So to me, the simple thing what you wanna do is have the provider doing the providing of healthcare and the bills be paid in the most logical way possible, which for an individual going to the dentist, you might be paying that dentist for those services provided. For the hospital, it might be you're paying the hospital to provide the care for the community for the next year. Mr. Holtzegan, is, is that gonna add up? I, I, I've never understood, I mean, honestly, I just don't understand the fascination with single-payer models. And, and, and there are a couple of reasons for that. I mean, number one, I, if you look at our problem, which is we spend a lot of money on, on health care and we don't get the uh, commensurate value, insurance isn't the problem. I mean, no matter what your opinion is of Americans' insurance companies, um, you know, you got the health care bill and then there's an insurance layer on top of it, which is just shifting around the health care bill so some expensive people 
don't pay the full cost and someone else picks it up. That's all it does. And, it, and you may not think it does it efficiently, but I did a calculation once that you could confiscate all of the profits of the insurance industry um, so that, you know, that, that they weren't profiting on American health care and you could take the efficiency gains and y you would get about two years worth of, of, of cost growth in the, in the U.S. health care system. So, you know, for about two years, you, you, you know, things would st settle down, but then we'd be right back to where we were again. So it, it's not, th th that's not where the money is. That's not the problem. And if you went to a single payer, suppose we went to a federal single payer, in the end, they're still going to have to negotiate with hospitals in Minneapolis and in, in uh, Syracuse, New York, and Washington, D.C., and, and those are local negotiations. And I am far from convinced that they can do it better. In fact, there's good reasons to fear they might do it worse. Politics, you know, once you run it through the federal government, it's going to turn political. I, and I say this, you know, it was my worst moment as a CDO director was sitting at a table like this and having a, a senator who should remain nameless say, what's the right price for inhalation therapy in Alabama? It's like, the fact that you're asking that question tells you everything that's wrong with our healthcare system. It shouldn't be running through the U.S. Senate. But if you had a single payer, we'd have two hospitals in a community, and the right thing to do is say, let's negotiate, see who gets the business, and you might get none. That's not a political outcome. Political yeah. outcomes split the baby. So I'm not sure they'll negotiate well at all. And, and so I'm, I don't see the single payer as a solution to the cost growth, and I don't see it as a solution to, to anything in the way of our, our fundamental problems. So, so let, me, let me just pick, because I want to I direct this to you, because this is my first question to you. For those of us who follow what goes on in Washington closely, there is a very palpable and I think reasonable uh, skepticism that, that shifting, having the government as the payer uh, is going to take politics out of this and move things towards efficiency rather than more in the direction of where we're already going. What, what's wrong? I mean, what's sure. wrong with this basic point? Well, the, Mr. Holtz, Eakin's point that the savings from the profits of the insurance industry, it's one tiny portion. I agree. That wouldn't be enough to finance health care. That's why I don't think a public option makes any sense. It's just one more plan that's going to be without um, it's not going to have any profit. It's not going to have other things. We have nonprofit health insurance companies in Minnesota. That doesn't fix the problem. The problem is when I go to the hospital, the neck surgery a few years ago, $21,000 bill. My health plan only paid $7,000 of it. I only paid $200. Who paid the rest of it? I mean, we don't have a market system like that for pricing. And the way it comes up to a $21,000 bill is, oh, you had two Tylenol in the middle of the night, and that cost 50 bucks. I mean, they, there's so much cost shifting, it's not a logical system. What we want to have is the same way when the health plans, Blue Cross is negotiating, well, Blue Cross or Regent is negotiating with Hennepin County Medical Center for the care they get there, and all those things are negotiated. We're going to have one health plan do the negotiating, and I don't think it should be one negotiation from Washington. It does have to be local negotiations to base it on the need. But the savings are that you don't have to have every nurse spending all her time calculating, or 10% of her time calculating writing down all the things to bill the person, all the billing system. That's not insurance company profit. Underwriting. You don't need underwriting. You cover everybody. So the bottom line is there's savings in all those things. Yeah, our plan would have it where the administration of the billing and to go on could be done by, it could contract out with a private provider if you wanted, but you don't need to. The point is it's not government running the healthcare system. It's government collecting the money, government paying the money, government negotiating the prices, and not in Washington. It's negotiated in community by community. Okay, thank you, Senator Marty. We've got a very patient question over here. And, and that's what I'm saying. With the way health partners is trying to do it in a community like that, let's just do that for everybody. Put them all in a health plan that does that. And that's the way you have to do it. I mean, health partners, when people say, oh, well, like with medical assistance, um, Medicaid in Minnesota, um, well, we decide to contract out instead of fee for service, which is so expensive. Instead, we, which I'm arguing is not so expensive, it's so expensive when it's done wrong. But what we're doing instead is we're spending more money to hire a middleman, an insurance plan, to pay fee for service because Health Partners runs its own hospitals, its own clinics, its own everything else. They still pay their doctors fee for service. So we're just paying a middleman to pay the fee for service. 
what I'm saying is, yes, that's the way you want to do it. You want to have health care coordinated in a logical way. And that payer, instead of being one, which means somebody's left out, because the whole problem with having all these plans is you are never going to stop the cracks that people fall into. The most vulnerable people with mental illness, chemical dependency problems, the poor, they're always going to fall through the cracks when there are cracks to fall into, and multiple plans imply that you're going to have cracks. Thank you, Senator Marty. Uh, Mr. Mr. Holtz, again, let me just broaden that question and ask you, I think there's pretty broad agreement, though I would not say a consensus by any means, that shifting away from fee-for-service uh, is something that has to be looked at carefully, and it's probably the direction we have to go in to get a better control over health inflation. Fee-for-service medicine is evil and needs to go away. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you said <laughs> it, not me. Um, so let me, what do you see as, as the promising directions uh, under a whole variety yeah. of scenarios. What, what strikes you is, because Minnesota's been one of the places where, mm -hmm. and some of the people here have been involved in discussions, and Governor Pawlenty, mm -hmm. uh, some of the folks in the legislature have been involved. But I'm curious from what you see around the country, what strikes you as, as kind of promising alternative models? So, so I think, number one, it's important not to pick an alternative model. And again, one of my concerns with, uh, with the, the, the reform we got was, you know, broad consensus that we have to have uh, greater coordination of care, um, maybe have medical homes or whatever label you want to attach to that. Um, you know, th there's a lot of uh, research suggests that'd be valuable, but to write an ACO rule in Washington and take a look at that thing, uh, you know, you, you, don't get a, you don't get any confidence that you're going to get the outcomes you want. So without picking a model, we know that the problem we see is um, that that the medical system is too episodic in nature um, and fragmented. And so you need to, to fix both the fragmentation and the episodic nature. So on the fragmentation, that means that instead of, you know, um, uh, paying on a fee-for-service basis all the pieces of a, of a bypass, say, you know, the, the, the pre-admission screens and all the, the pre-op and then the, the, the graphs themselves, uh, post-op post, uh, care, discharge and follow-up, you know, pay for the entire episode of care in a bundle. Um, if you do that um, with a, the sort of a quality metric and a risk adjustment, what do you do? You create a business model where all those providers now have an incentive to coordinate with each other at low cost, and so you have built a business model for health information technology. Uh, they they want to have it, and instead of the business model now, which is if I have your records, you have to come back to me, so we don't want to share. Now they want to share the records. Um, and the more you can bundle and do things like that, the more you're going to give get efficiencies because the lower the cost of the care, the, the more they can they can make, and so bun, you know just bundling on steroids is, is going to be it. And in the end, I, I want to see these comprehensive managed approaches. And then the fragmentation is the insurance problem, right? If you, if you see someone for just a year, if you have no particular state, you know, and, and you know you do the medical underwriting, you do all the things we hear so much about. So there is n there's no reason why we should uh, have a blind adherence to this accident history called employment employee uh, employer sponsored insurance and if we had policies that were portable from job to job and from job to retirement and which um, insurance companies you know had some some basic uh, rules such as if you kept continuous coverage they couldn't underwrite you when you renewed things like that I mean wh what would you do well you, you now have lifetime calculations by insurance companies they, they do the, the trade-offs between prevention and, ac and acute care all the things that we'd like to see that, that took us from episodic care to, to more continuous and effective care, you know, that isn't hard to do. And we mm -hmm. ought to just be pushing in those directions and you know, take, off, take out silly things like an open-ended subsidy to employer-sponsored health insurance that's bigger for rich people. I mean, that, that, that's just counter to any sensible economic model of what you want to do. Uh, can I follow up on two of his points? One on the I mean, accountable care organizations. I, I happen to agree with him that I think that we don't, I don't know what they are. Everybody who defines it, well, it's not, no, it's not that. I have We're several hundred pages that will tell you yeah, exactly what one Exactly what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and next week, it's somebody else who will respond to that by saying, no, it's none of those. And so, I, again, I don't think the, the whole solution is somehow we're going to find this magic way to pay for it. I remember an econ on fee-for-service being bad. I remember something I was at here at the U of M. I don't know if it was a U of M economist or somebody else talked about. He said there are many ways you can pay for health care, and the worst three are fee-for-service, capitation, and salaries. 
which is sort of a combination of everything that we do some way or another, and, and explain the person, whoever it was, explain it very neatly. The incentive for fee for service is to treat as many people as you can for as many things as you can. For capitation, the thing is to treat as many people as you can for as few things as you can. And for salaries, it's to treat as few people for as few things as you can. Now, that's a very cynical approach, but those are all, there's a little underlying thing there. I mean, you're never going to eliminate all those. It's part of human nature, perhaps. I don't think most doctors go into it in order to make money. Some might. Most of them want to provide the right care for their patients. But the bottom line is we're not going to magically sit down and get all the best experts together and say, this is the way we ought to pay for health care because, frankly, I think you ought to pay for hospital care differently than you pay for somebody going into a physical therapist. Thank you. We have a question over here, I believe. And, and I would say that we're not doing enough research as a society on that. And, and frankly, the numbers are so huge, we ought to just address the problem rather than study it first. Because we do know the costs of it in many ways. Um, for instance, with, um, with um, three years ago, Governor Pawlenty cut our general assistance medical care. He, his own commissioner said it's 35,000 of the sickest, poorest people in the state. He said it saved $381 million. How do you know that? The line item in the state budget, $381 million a year. It's pretty clear it saved $381 million. Yes, under one condition, that those 35,000 very sick people cooperate and stop getting sick. And they don't stop getting sick. They get sicker, and they use the emergency room more and more and more. And if you look at the costs, I mean, uh, uh, Harvard economist, um, Bill Shaw did a study of a single-payer system in Vermont. He concluded it would save 25% on an ongoing basis. It started about 12%, but grow to about 25% over the next 15 years or so. Um, that's a huge saving. That's $10 billion a year in Minnesota, where we spend about $40 billion. He didn't even factor in some of the things. When I talked to them a couple of times, I said, what about the impacts on non-health care things, like prison population, like out-of-home placement of juveniles? One of the biggest expenses our counties have is foster care and child protection services. Why? Because so many, 99% of the kids who are in foster care, their parents were chemically dependent, mentally ill, or both, and untreated. We address those things. So the numbers are huge. We don't measure it good enough. I don't know if we could measure it good enough, but I can tell you anybody who looks at it is going to talk. The fee savings are outside of the savings that Bill Chow calculated for a single health system for Vermont. And thank you very much, Senator uh, uh, Marty. Um, Mr. Holtegan, this is one of the areas where it, it, it gets a little frustrating. I feel like I'm, I'm lost again because I, <laughs> you know, there's no doubt that, that folks who are concerned about the most disadvantaged uh, among us, uh, so, you know, many of whom are absolutely helpless. Um, and, and those who are saying, quite rightly, uh, there's only so much we can afford and, and they're looking at the global situation and, and You'd be a fool not to be alerted to that. Is there some way through this in which we can afford to uh, cover people at, um, at, in a way that's more cost effective and sustainable financially? So I, I think the key is to not make the mistake of trying to have one solution to multiple problems. I mean, you have multiple uh, populations here. You've got the sort of conventional population where we'd like to have a more efficient delivery system and a better function insurance system, and where there may be some, some uh, subsidies to lower income Americans to help them buy their insurance. Then you've got a second set, which are uh, people who don't fit the insurance model. They have, they have chronic conditions, and you, and you simply aren't going to put them in a conventional insurance model and have it be successful. There you're going to have to have something that looks like a high risk pool or, or some additional uh, assistance that recognizes the ratio of healthcare cost to income something that's just not manageable uh, um, under the regular system. Then you have the third population, which is at the heart of this question, which is uh, those who don't fit the, the, uh, the model of capable of managing their own finances, capable of even with uh, wise guidance making the decisions they need to make. We have, a lot, we have some of them in programs now, the dual eligibles and Medicare and Medicaid have a lot of these characteristics. We have some outside programs, and, and I just don't think you should pretend that those three, and we could probably do a different um, dissection of the population. I don't think you should think those three are all going to get solved by the same reforms. That's so not that's not a sensible way to go. 
So uh, th that makes sense, and yet it, it seems to bring us back to the highly fragmented, atomized, multiple payer, multiple provider uh, chaos that we have today, doesn't it? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, you've got strat national strategies for, th for th sort of three different groups, and I don't, I don't think that's the same as uh, what we have today because within those, we set the, the, the incentives so that they align and we get actually, you know, further, you know, as I said before, you know, some, some comprehensive view of the, of the care uh, uh, condition and some uh, long-term view of the insurance decision, you know, we'll, we'll do much better if we, if we set those incentives up. Yeah, because I just and look and at... And, and I mean, remember, again, for the, the populations that, you know, like particularly the, the majority of Americans, the key is to make sure that there's something that looks like a budget out there that, that people have to respect. I mean, that's that. Thank, thank you very much. Let me just get another question. Ahead, yeah, ahead. And please identify yourself. Thank you. I'll say it's, it's definitely better than what we have right now in terms of certain things. My disagreement with you would be on well, two things. One, it doesn't solve all the problems. Frankly, the, the people we were talking about a few minutes ago, the chronically, mentally ill, chemically dependent population, giving them a voucher that then they can go get the care. You know, when somebody's homeless, they don't have a watch, they don't have a file cabinet, they don't have a thing, appointment calendar. You know, we have to, we have to, some people, it's in our interest to push them to get the care up front because of the other cost to society. And so my, my, Uh-huh. And, and I, I'm not disagreeing with you about people being able to go out and pick the provider. That's where the competition should be. Are you going to provide me with better care or that doctor, this clinic or that clinic? I think to me that's where the patient should have the choice and me shopping around to say whether Blue Cross or Health Partners does better. Um, I'm just not sure. We're talking to blue boxes and we're talking to all the other kinds of companies and it's true that the boxes are more costly than the other. Right. I don't really think blue is actually that high up. I think the basic is being updated and I think it's being updated on budget and I don't think the average is going to live on $300. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 if it was a comprehensive benefits, which you would, you would so say you're talking basic benefits. But, but We're spending our 10% is roughly what, other than Switzerland and about two other countries, their entire healthcare budget is. Switzerland's a little bit more than that, a little more than half but, what we do. But right. This is good. And Mr. Holtzika, I'm, I'm curious if you want to say publicly, do you, do you support this national this, voucher? This is actually very similar in uh, design to the premium support plan. I mean, that there, there's a, a lot that has. So. So that there, th th there you. are always a you know, couple of key pieces here. First is this is a defined contribution approach. I endorse that. Um, uh, there's always the, the question then of what, what kind of architecture you put into the insurance markets so that you can get adequate competition. I don't think you can just pretend that we're doing fine in that front. We're not. So we need good competition to make these things go. Um, a lot of these are going to turn out to be managed uh, care-like uh, entities and the HMO experience with that is they just they didn't just they just didn't spend right and that's the way they, they solve this problem. So there will have to be a commitment to quality metrics that are understandable and transparent and allow you to do the comparison shopping. Um, there's no question about that. And so you know there th there's a lot more to this than than just you know yeah we're gonna we're gonna write a check to everybody. But I think that there is no question that there is a, a shared belief that Americans want to help those unable to. Uh, afford uh, health insurance and, and the care that comes with it um, to, to get there. So I don't view that as a radical departure from where we are right now. I mean, well, the, the question is, this is, I mean, this, this is the difference between that and where we're headed. Where we're headed right now is we're going to put everybody up to 133% of federal poverty line on Medicaid. 
Everyone between uh, 134 and about 300% of the federal poverty line is going to end up in the exchanges. I, th I think CBO is just wrong. Maybe. Employers are going to throw them all in there. Maybe. And then above that, we're going to have concierge medicine. So do you want to have a system like Larry, where there is a, 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 a common set of uh, benefits and some sort of coherence across the nation, or are you happy with the three-class system? Because we're headed, we're headed for a three-class system. Bad Medicaid, okay insurance stuff, and concierge. Well, well, so, so let, That's me, where we're headed. Let me just, I'm, I'm curious <laughs> about this because some of at least the talking points and criticism of the Affordable Care Act is focused on the government involvement. And there's a lot of government involvement, what you're talking about, plus there is inevitably going to be redistribution of resources because so you're creating a, a voucher in which those who have less, and those who are sicker, are going to need to have, if it is truly experience rated, so, so wait, that, wait, that will wait. get more resources. Full stop. Roll the clock back to 2009, before uh, 2008, before any of this happens. There's an agreement on both sides of the aisle that we need health care reform, that what we have is not um, acceptable. So that's not in dispute. At that time, we had enormous government involvement in, in the healthcare system. Medicare is the biggest payer, Medicaid and Medicare balance. They're paying almost half the nation's bills anyway. Mm -hmm. So the, the notion that somehow this is the first toe in the water from the government is, is just <laughs> ludicrous. And there's enormous redistribution right now, much of it disguised. Um, cost shifting from Medicare and Medicaid to private payers, uh, at, and, and employee sponsored insurance exclusion that, that de facto yeah, redistributes. No, so no, right. so, so th there's, I mean, th the question then is just, you know, do you think this reform somehow takes that system and moves it in a direction that, that has a more coherent set of redistribution that actually you know, solves the, the cost growth problem and that would, as a result, uh, fix this mess that, that we had in, in 2008. The answer is no. I mean, it, it goes the wrong direction in many ways. I mean, take a um, classic example, the Independent Payment Advisory Board. Uh, the importation of a naive academic idea put 15 people, experts, insulated from pressure, let them make decisions. I don't care who those 15 people are. Their job is going to be to, in one year, have the Medicare program hit a spending target. How are they going to do that? They have one year. They can't change a business model. They can't do any preventive uh, models. They can't do anything except cut reimbursement for something. What are they going to cut? Uh, the most expensive therapies or drugs that just came out. So the newest things, which are probably our hope in the long run, are going to get whacked. So we're going to have a random tax on innovation. It's a horrifically bad idea. And so I just think the, 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 we just went the wrong direction. I mean, take whatever talking points you want. It's just a bad reform. Yeah, thank you. Larry, Larry your system, I, I like it to the extent it covers people, but it doesn't cover the things that I'll say people say, oh, that's Cadillac care, chemical dependency treatment, all the extra things that, frankly, people need. Dental care is just as important as every other kind of care. Eye care. And... Well, frankly, if, if we're spending 17% of GDP right now going on 18%, if we brought it down to 15%, we'd be doing a heck of a lot better. And to me... But, but the trouble... I, I think I, th I hear you. I, I think I think the the issues here are well defined. Yeah. Uh, Chari. I think you've you've defined the issue well, which is wh what's the scope of this this benefit plan? And I think one is a is a definition in terms of what can we afford. With as you said, though, it would there would be a group of of know it alls who would who would who would help to define that, and, and Charlie, as much as we adore you and respect you, uh, I don't know if your elixir is going to make it uh, with the, the know-it-alls. Uh, Senator Marty is going to want to push that envelope, and I think this opens the door, frankly, to just the concern that Mr. Holtz Eakin has raised and many, many others about, you know, how do you prevent what becomes a, a government role from becoming a backdoor for political influence? Because we all know Chari is well-connected, and he's going to you know, fund his lobbyists and his good friends in Washington to make sure we're all drinking his, his wonderful food drink. Can, can I just, just two, two comments. I mean, number one, I, I don't buy the public care tradition. Th there is something called public health. There, there are, there's sanitation and sewage and, and vaccinations and a whole lot of things that, that fit a, a classic definition of public good where the government's involvement's uh, actually been the single most important thing about increased lo uh, longevity. Most of that comes from, from, from public health and, and not from 
the kinds of medical science we hear so much about. That, that may be the next uh, improvement. The second is there's nothing about the private sector that can't solve this problem. In fact, it would. I mean, the most expensive patient in the American healthcare system is a, is a depressed diabetic. Why? Because diabetics, if they don't stay on their regime, develop all sorts of very expensive conditions and medications and all sorts of horrific things. And depressed diabetics don't care. So they don't stay on their regimes. And so a private insurer who had the right incentives, who might own that person over the life cycle, would think to themselves, man, we don't have to pick between mental health and physical health. We need both on this person. And uh, so we've got to keep them from being depressed and keep them on their regime. Uh, and it will turn out that the cheaper thing is not actually expensive uh, antidepressants. It's talk therapy because, you know, getting some people to talk is really cheap. My mother, for example, nothing. Um, <laughs> And, you know, so, so the, uh, the private sector is going to do that. They're going to they're gonna bundle together yoga. They're going to bundle together talk therapy. They're going to bundle together antidepressants and, and the, the insulin because that's their financial interest. So you don't need a, a, a definition of benefits to solve that problem. You just have to have better competition. Hey, we, have a, we have a question right here in the middle. From, yes, thank you. Yes, you. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm blinded by the lights. I'm just looking out here. Did you have a question? <clears throat> I don't think the administrative burden of having a, a support system that gives more to people who are sicker and who have you know, a, a claims record that indicates they're, they're sicker, it's, it's not expensive to go through those claims and figure out wh where people are. We know their incomes, um, so you know th this is not a, a heroic undertaking, and, and it's not going to divert a lot of resources. Instead, it would take the the resources that are currently being driven out uh, in wasteful fee for service medicine and target them on having people be well. So I, I just disagree with the premise. No, I I'm, I actually know the difference, and I disagree. I I think that's the huge that's the number one large expense that we're just ignoring the fact it's such a fragmented thing because you have to spend all the time billing. If we had our schools doing that, it would be no sense for every teacher every day to sit down, this kid got that many minutes of my time, they got spent this many on notebooks, this much on utility costs, and bill their parents' school insurance. It wouldn't make any sense. We want the schools to teach, we want healthcare to do it. But I want to respond to Chari's point for a minute to say that I don't want the political system to do it. Our proposal is to have a quasi-governmental, you might call it, democratically selected board, and so on, professionals who are then making the decisions. We keep our budget of our Minnesota Health Plan totally separate from the governor and legislature because I don't want people to be going in so the, the experts that are sitting down and calculating, does this count as alternative medicine, as proven results, is this something that's in our interest to do? Because yeah, I'm in the end of moving to a lot of things, some people say, oh, that's extra. I don't know about your $100 elixir, but you know, yeah, yeah. it may be <laughs> snake. <laughs> but the point is, it shouldn't be a political decision. And right now, it becomes a political decision when government has to step in and mandate certain coverages because insurers aren't covering them. I promise. Can I just say, I mean. Last comment. Go ahead. I, I've been in Washington. I've never been in Minnesota. But I, you know, I spent time on the Medicare Payment Advisory uh, Commission. That's where they send old CBO directors to die. and. Um, there, there was no political uh, influence there because we had no power. <laughs> we made recommendations; they didn't have any st any sting at all. But if you, the minute you give them some power, boy, right. they'd be climbing uh, all over the med pack. And, and I've, yeah. you know, I've seen Medicare rife with political interference for years. I don't see how you avoid it. I know there are a lot of questions and comments still out there. Um, on the other hand, uh, our fearless leader Chari uh, tells me time is up. And uh, so I want to thank this wonderful uh, panel and recognize uh, Charlie as well. Thank you very much to our panelists. Thank you.